We are just one day away from Africa Day, and as we celebrate Africa Month, more and more young music artists are seeing themselves as the new generation of musicians that want to take music from our continent to greater heights. This African vision is also shared by my guest tonight. Good evening and welcome to Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. Composer, jazz guitarist Billy Monama has made it his mission to preserve the African indigenous music heritage and revive ancient guitar playing styles found in genres such as umbaganga, umkashio, as well as umaskandi. In his brief musical journey, he has performed at a number of important events such as the Standard Bank Joy of Jazz Festival, Umoja, followed by collaborative performances with the likes of US saxophonist Dave Cars. But what's truly special about Billy Monama is his ability to bring music greats like Alan Quella, Pat Metheny, Tal Farlow, and even Jimi Hendrix to the Mbakanga party with him, with none of them sounding out of place. All we have to say is, hey, Billy. Hey, Billy. Do you know you and I have got something in common? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, stand is it. Oh, I am not going to yeah. deny such, such allegations. Yeah. I'm yeah. not denying. Yeah. We both studied political science. Yes. Hey, Did you study at Tux? Yeah. We but now, imagine, my man, my people get excited. Since study she studied political science, you know, like, um, uh, it was never completed. I dropped it out because of music. Yes, uh, but yeah. that's why I'm saying we have something in common. Oh, okay, you that I okay, okay, okay. I say, I'm I say here yes for to, you. I I'm say to that. I say yes to that. Yeah. What was it about political? Or was it just something you like? Let me just study this so I can get a degree. You must understand that uh, you know, as a black child, Mongtua, when you grow up, they, uh, they say, "What do you want to be like, Gary? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to be like, uh, Sipo? Sipo says, "No, I want to be a doctor." The other one says, "I want to be a lawyer," and I said, "I want to be a musician." And they're like, whoa. Uh, our parents immediately thought quite a star. Oh, yeah. They, 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 Sumbang Mante was our way. Already the reference that they have, they're like, oh, my God, yo, <laughs> he died like a pauper, yo, umozi. You know when, okay, anyway, before we get there, so now it was a choice that, uh, you know, I had to make to, to please my, um, my mother. Mm. Uh, you know, and at school, I was very interested in history. Mm. And even even adversity. I mean, even after uh, um, um, my metric, mm. I still continue, you know, doing history. Even now, I'm still doing history. I in was my about own. to say we're gonna talk about yes, this in okay. terms of you documenting music. Yes. It's still you liking yes. history. But then, when you're picking to go and study political science. Has your mother ever seen you play a guitar? Yes. Remember, I started playing in 1997. I started playing guitar in 1997. So now the first audience that I had, it was at church. The so she knows you can play? Yes. The first time, she didn't know that I was playing guitar until one day the guitar player at church was absent. <laughs> Enter Billy and from stage And then left. when they get up on the stage, don't say guitar, shy number. My mother was shocked to death. She even took me photos. I still have photos when, I mean, you know, those photos are very special. But now, Billy, you, you started playing guitar because you picked up a neighbor's guitar. That is true. I, I never owned a guitar. So now, so now um, uh, uh, this gentleman by, name, by the name of Keiza Kekana um, mm. uh, is the uncle of my friend. He had a guitar, so he taught me how to uh, he taught me how to play guitar. And then on the other street I, I, across, there was a a, 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 a family of Galtzele, yeah. uh, Jimmy Tsebe. He's the greatest guitarist ever. You guys, you don't know. He influenced. <laughs> he influenced. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, like a, a grassroots guitar. He, I mean, like, we started, you know, practicing using those guitars. I never owned a guitar. And then the only time I see the guitar is when I go to a church choir practice, mm. a church. Remember, I was at church four times in a week. Hello? So I was at church Wednesday. I was at Youth church for the... Youth, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. band, <laughs> church. <laughs> so now I was always around the music. I, I, I was always surround, surround, uh, surrounded by the music. There was a choir. I could have chosen to be a tenor, a singer, yeah. or uh, you know, a, a, a vocalist in general. But what fascinated me, what drew my attention in the music, was the sound of the guitar. So where does music take you? Well, it takes me into many places. Uh, let's talk about spirituality. For me, when I play music, it's like intercession. It makes me to have conversation with God. Mm -hmm. I get to uh, reach other heights of spirituality. 
That's where it takes me. Be, be, beside the Gutiang Tata, you say America, you say Botswana. Excessively, because I was watching this clip of you, yeah. and I was so curious. I'm, I'm like, where is he right now? In fact, it's only fair that you at home also get to watch. Just, just, just watch his face. Watch his face. <laughs> Okay. Huh? Wow. That video. Right? Very special. Yeah. I just got goosebumps. Yeah. Wait, come on. Where were you? Like, when you're on stage, because you say spiritually you're speaking with God, physically it takes you around the world, you know, uh, showcasing your talent. Yeah. But in that moment, what are you thinking? Or do you even see that there's an audience there when you're creating something like that? I, I, I personally don't want to even know who is in the audience. Uh. Because once I know that there's someone of a certain caliber is there, yeah. I might be shaken. So usually I don't want to see who is in the audience. I want to be at the backstage, you know, um, uh, have my meditation with my instrument, you know, relax. Because now, once I know who is in there, I will maybe, you know, psychologically you'll want mm. to impress those people. You know, it, it won't be music anymore. It will be about those people, mm. you know, who are in the audience. Imagine if George Benson was to walk in the show. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, uh, so uh, what happens uh, on stage to answer your question is that at that time, I don't see myself closing my eyes. I don't see myself what's happening with me. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to remember each and everything that we have rehearsed. I'm trying to remember what is the next song. I'm trying to connect with, with, with God so that mm. when this song, remember when this song, when this note, when this musical note, it hits the, the listener, the audience, mm. that's when someone, people will say after the show, like, that song touched me. Ah. How does it touch you if you don't connect with the instrument first? Okay. Okay. You need to connect with the instrument yeah. first. So it's, it's, it's a divine th thing. So, okay. No, no, please. Um, yes. I, because, you know, jazz almost seems like such an isolating, that in terms of the creation of it. So when a song comes to you and you compose it and you write it, you know, wh what mood must you be in? What must you be eating? What must you be wearing? Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of the creation, um, uh, you know, it, it, it can come when you're sad, when you're in love, when you're happy, when you're crying, mm. you know. Um, so it, 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 um, a composition is not, it's not an invitation by uh, uh, you, me and you personally. Mm. It's, it's a gift, you know. Uh, this, this melody will come to your dreams. This melody will come to you. In the morning, you hum this melody that is, doesn't exist. Mm. And then you're like, mm, I wonder whose song is this? <laughs> okay. You know, so you start questioning with maybe you are humming a song that you had last night, uh, but you're like, okay, no, this should be a composition. I've because never hummed the song before, and yes, now it's here. Because there's so many cases whereby, uh, you know, copyright, there's copyright fights in terms of which I, which I go my act. Because, because this, this composition was influenced by another. Ah, composition. Ah. So now you need to make sure with, you, with yourself, live it. If it comes to you again and again, then you, we have the song. So you, you add Makufe, you come back because you've heard that your mother passed away. Yeah. You bury your mother. Yo. And then the very next day you leave to go to France. Yo. That was, yeah. What song finds you? Because you're saying when you said a song will find you. That surely said the fact that you can't be in one place to grieve your yeah. mother because you've got obligations. In in the album, the, uh, in my debut album, uh, Rebound, yeah. there's two there are two songs that they caught me in that um, uh, uh, situ no. uh, situation, if I have to call it. First of all, there's a song titled Lifukibu Pilo. So now it yeah. means um, uh, 
death is life. Yeah. Because when I was in that situation, I asked myself, where do people go when they die? Mm. And until today, I still haven't found the answer because I've ne I, I was never once going to die. <laughs> I never died before. Be but in my, in my mind, I think maybe they are at a, peace, at a, peace, a, a peaceful uh, place in heaven. As has been mentioned, that yeah. the Bible says that there's heaven and there's hell. Why hell? We have a man. Imagine like everything. That is why it's because we are not sure where we're going. So now the song Lifukibu Pilo came into into um, into me in during that uh, morning situation. Yeah. And there's a song again in the Dike album lady. called Him for Dike Lady. Yeah. Dike Lady was my mother, was my, my late mother. Now Mina, we first fear France in Karomela. We first fear France. I'm waiting here. We first fear France. I had a show at State Theatre. I called the promoter, said, listen, uh, I want to tell this, said, Billy, no ways. A show has to go on. After the funeral, boom, drive to State Theatre, sound check. After, after the show at the, at, at the State Theatre, France, in the short space of time. <laughs> you see the lives people live, guys, and they're still here to tell the tale. After the break is the voice of the guitar disappearing. Are we documenting enough of our history, of our indigenous music, and whose responsibility is it to document the history of our music? You also want to keep watching because later we bring you writer and author of Sorry Not Sorry, Haji Muhammad Davji. Stay with us. Welcome back. While jazz legend Herbie Tsoaeli released his first album at just the age of 49, Billy Monama confirmed his creative mastery at just the age of 32, dropping his new album Rebounds last year. It was in the years of studying music when he realized that there was not much documented about African guitar history. And so the art of memory making and the grassroots project was born. Billy Monama's love for jazz knows no bounds. He's passionate about the genre and activist for the music and all he wants is to recreate that authentic sound through a fresh and more vibrant energy so you're doing an assignment you go to the library you're looking f you know for help <laughs> kitty kitty can't yeah, find a book yeah it's so very, you decide let me write it it's, ve it's very sad yeah it you is. Know, do we have time to talk about this how much of time do you have with you uh, um <laughs> seven minutes <laughs> Listen, now, I'm going to make, I'm, I'm going to give such a, a brief of this. Um, I mean, on, on, on Freedom Day, I did an interview and then asked me with what is freedom to me. I'm like, no, we are um, free, yes, because we don't need to carry our passes, but we still live in chains. Okay. We're talking about what is Africa Day mean? Africa Day means that, you know, we celebrate um, uh, our, our, our freedom, our independence as African. Uh, uh, you know, from colonization. So when I was a student, it is indeed that um, I was given an assignment to go and research about South African guitar styles of playing. And when I got to library, believe me, there was nothing documented. And when I was doing cultural exchange program, I was in, um, I was in Norway. And um, when I played the guitar, that's when I realized the, um, the value of South African guitar. Because distinct. they could tell. Distinct. Yebo is yeah. distinct. Pelo, umazo suka le kwazul. Umazo kulmana azul. Apana kwazul. Agala mpela kwe tumpu kwa kwazul. And then, wabula wabula shangani. But they know that yeah. if, if, if you are in the, in the deeper north, you hear a guitar, you can only hear that this is shangani music. Yeah. And all this, all this uh, guitar, um, uh, um, um, uh, academics, they were never documented in an academic uh, uh, way. Why is that in the time of Mongeningem, you know, in the time of Jimmy Zuzu, why is that? Hey, I don't know, you know, I think um, 
Uh, that is why somewhere they said to me, uh, on some article, they said to me, which be like, I'm a guiden of heritage. And then some people, they're like, oh, I'm a guiden of heritage. <laughs> I'm like, you, you, you know, I grew up, I grew up uh, with the influence of the Nicholas Nduli, uh, Patrick Chalinchali, Mahona Tohe, you know, um, uh, a kind of a guitar uh, a, a driven music mm. that was with uh, Motila Queens and Matlatini mm. and Western Kosi. Matlatini, guys. You, you know, I mean, the songs that started by the guitar, the, the introduction of the guitar. So the guitar dominates. So now the guitar, it, 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 it actually defines the, the, the sound of South African music. You know, so now in, in, in library, I found nothing. So I went back to the school. I said, there's nothing. They said, no way. I said, there's nothing. So, so where are you now? Are you writing the book? Are you doing the research? I'm not, I'm not, writing, I'm not, I'm not writing a book at that time. At that time, I'm still a student. Okay. So I, when, when, when I was sitting uh, one day, I say, I can imagine the next coming generation without... The next Billy. Yeah, the next Billy, yes. The next Billy um, uh, not having information about South African uh, guitar style. Then I then took the initiative. That was the birth of the grassroots project. That was the birth of uh, the introduction to South African guitar styles. Then I took the initiative. I proposed to... Um, I proposed to the stu uh, to the schools that I want to come and do uh, master classes there, and you know I I I I I, I also um, got incorporated with um, uh, Samro. Mm. They funded mm. they funded my 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 tour to 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 make to, to make this awareness about uh, South African uh, guitar styles. So now, as we're speaking, the manuscript of the book is there. Yes. The, the magic book is just waiting for that moon, 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 moon. So <laughs> what, the, yeah. wh where do you want this book to end up? Are we putting it in all music schools? Um, you know, at the University of Pretoria, there's a music department there. That book needs to make it in there in the syllabus. Yes, I mean, uh, 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 according to standard of, um, you know, uh, publishing the, 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 the first uh, books, they go to national libraries, mm. you know, and uh, national uh, libraries, and then uh, uh, doing a target, um, uh, uh, because we're going to say the beginners, intermediate, and advanced. So now, for, for someone who, who is self-taught, he can also have a DVD version of it, whereby he can, he can, he can watch the, 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 the DVD, the presentation of a tutorial mm. uh, on a screen, and those who are academics, they will go to University of Vets, University of so and so forth. You know, so yes, you, uh, like that's it. where, yeah. Even... If in a corner, logs in so in what is it will be available. I was so annoyed when I heard you didn't bring your guitar, and I understand because you say it gets stolen, you should just leave it in your car. I thought people like you travel with their guitars everywhere and you just whip it out and you start playing. Because I wanted you to run me through the different riffs, because you say there's there's different riffs that, that you started and you know exactly where it belongs. But when you come back, you're gonna yeah. do that for us. I'll bet. <laughs> you're gonna do it first. Shine up. <laughs> you're gonna do it first. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do that. Okay, so yeah. grassroots project, you know, in, in its life now, where is it? What is happening with it? Can people participate in it? Yes, uh, you know, people, people, uh, 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 um, uh, they even call me grassroots. They're like, yeah, grassroots. You know, uh, 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 and whenever they hear old music. They just look at me, hey, Billy, you know, every time I've been tagged about everything that is ancient, mm. you know, like, hey, Billy, uh, because I think I've, rep I've, I've represented South African music, you know, I've documented it uh, from the grassroots level. Now, what is grassroots? From, for me, the, when we have three, we have the leaves, we have the stems, and the roots. Mm. The roots, they die, the tree, I mean, there's, there's no tree without the yeah. roots. So now, we as South Africans, before we get to the microwave music that is trending now, there is where we come from. Mm. I'm sorry to say microwave, but digital music. Digital music that is happening now, <laughs> computer music, yeah. there's, uh, there's, um, uh, uh, there, there's where we come from. And then without knowing where we come from, I think that we sing a lot we, yeah. we might lose. Can get lot, lost, yes. diluted, and thin. But you know what's the nice thing? I, right now, because there's internet and there's so much information out there, even when the youngsters, teen, as like, we can reroute, you know, <laughs> and then we reroute mm. back to the roots. Mm. That is why you hear the remix mm. of the old, I mean, of the old classics mm. that they're being done by, you know. Listen, this is a fascinating conversation, and you're right, seven minutes is not enough. 
uh, yeah. we, we, we shall have it at length. We're going to bring you back and a few other young maestros in music yes. and we'll discuss it. But Billy, thanks so much for your time. Uh, great pleasure it's been chatting to Billy Monama. He's got a very busy schedule ahead of him. Listen to this. Tomorrow is at the Zakifo Festival in Durban. And for all of you going to Bushfire, he'll be on stage this Saturday. Next month, he'll be curating the Grassroots Project uh, at the Orbit on the 23rd of June. And then you can catch him live at the Market Theatre from the 27th to the 29th of July. And his latest album, Rebounds, is available in digital music stores. Go and check it out. Before we go to a break, I must remind you that Huawei is giving you a chance to win one of 10 Huawei cell phones. This is all you have to do. Real Talk, Huawei and MTN are partnering up to celebrate the release of the new Huawei P20 series. The Huawei P20 Pro, the world's first triple Leica lens camera, is partnering with MTN SA's fastest mobile network to help you capture the best moments with your friends and family. We'll be capturing timeless moments and connecting with people in need while giving you the chance to win the Huawei P20 Pro and 10 gigabytes free once-off MTN data. So tune into Real Talk for your chance to win. South Africans of color do not write what they like, spend too much money on spices, and white people have appropriated our pride, such as the Converse All-Star. And what's the deal with people pretending to be woke? Hmm? This is the observation of columnist and writer Haji Muhammad Daji, whose book looks at the experiences of brown people and never shies away from telling it like it is. Haji Muhammad Daji became Africa's first social media editor in a newsroom at the Mail and Guardian, where she went on to work as deputy digital editor. She once said the cat amongst the pigeons when she wrote that whites are happy to walk their dogs, but not their children. She continues to enrage readers on a number of print outlets where she's a columnist. All the way from the mother city, we welcome to Real Talk, Haji Muhammad Dabji. Hello. Hi, Nene. Thank you so much for having me. So when we tell people you and I were in high school together? <laughs> Let's just get it out the way now. Nene and I were in high school together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you know what I, I, I picked up when I was reading your book? The one thing that stood out to me immediately was you saying um, you you love people who can tell a story, right? You, yeah. you hold them in high regard. Yeah. And this was of this, a guy that lived in your building, Basil. Basil, Basil. Basil. that's him, Basil. Yeah. The stories weren't really true, but he told them well, yes. right? And you, you hold them in high regard. Is, is this a power that you are aware that you also have? Um, it's a power, I think, it, it definitely is a power that people do have, and yeah. I think it's a power that I hope to have. Ah. Um, I'm not sure that I do have it, but I definitely work hard and aspire towards it. To constantly hone yeah. it. Yeah, I always said like when I was younger, I used to have three dreams. One was to have a full passport of stamps. Okay. The other one was to be an astronaut, but here I am. That math mark thing. <laughs> that I know. It was, that math mark was it never going to make it happen. It was at that time with the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third one was to be able to tell good stories. What I love about what you say about telling stories as well, you say people who, can, who tell stories well, don't own the story. Yeah. They, they have the ability to let it go because they realize that as much as it's your experience, the story doesn't belong to you. Yes. It belongs to the ears that it yes. lands on, right? Yeah. So when you write a book with so many personal anecdotes, right, you know, there must have been some sort of ritual you had to do to let them go because they're not yours now. They're ours. They're in a book called Definitely. Sorry Not Sorry. Yeah. I think, you know, that was... The thing about a writer, and I think anyone who's in a creative, in I think anyone who does anything, is that you can't be precious about your work. Like, you absolutely can't. And I've been an editor in a newsroom where I've worked with people who are precious. And I think in the industry that we're in, I'm sure you've come across people uh. who are precious about their work as well. And there's this phrase that goes, kill your darlings. Yes. And I always do this with my writing. doesn't matter what I'm writing. I go and find the sentence that I love the most, and I delete it. <gasps> And it keeps you so humble. And so I think the book is a bigger metaphor of just deleting things uh. out of my life. Not deleting like the memories yeah. and not deleting my experiences, but to delete the preciousness I have or the hold that I have over certain things mm. and to just sort of give it away. And it belongs to someone else now. Mm. Are there people you had to consult 
before writing the stories in the book? Yo, you're putting me in the eyes now. Probably, <laughs> if you guys are out there. I'm sorry I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Like no, my publishers are thorough. They were th it was a thorough process. So if, if there were people that I needed to consult and, you know, say like, look, guys, this is quite personal. You're involved. Uh, um, uh. You know, then I, then I did go about that in a very personal way. Um, but a lot of it was... I'm so so um, strict about ethics in my life, especially as a journalist. We have to separate like a lot of things, and so I felt like as soon as you write something personal, as soon as you write a personal story, and if you engage with that before you let the story go, there's an ethical line that you that you risk mm. crossing. So a lot of times I didn't have those conversations prior. Did you have the conversations with yourself because? You led us into, because I, I, uh, I read the book with, with the person who helped, uh, Andy, so she helped me write the episode, right. right? So we prepped together, all of that. And so she read her book, her copy, and I was reading mine. And then she said to me, what do you think? I said, I was halfway, and I'm like, oh, she's not letting me in, man. Th this is just cool stuff. It's just, it's there, it's there. And then you hit the ages where you start saying, age this, age yes. that. And all of a sudden, it's, it's, it just came undone. Yeah. You it then unravels. give me, <laughs> dude, it unravels. You then give us everything. And then I was engrossed and I was, I couldn't sleep. I was just reading <laughs> it. So surely you're having conversations with yourself about how vulnerable and how open you're being and how yeah. honest you're being yeah. in this. What conversations are you having with yourself then? Sure, that the, chap the specific chapter that you mentioned now is, it was so touch and go for me. It was by far the hardest chapter. I can imagine. Second only to the one about my dad. Um, that I had to write because I was, it was daunting, you know, it was like, Yo, these are like real hard things. And like, as you're writing, you're starting to remember things that you forgot yourself, oh. you know, and it's starting to surface and you start to have these conversations with yourself. And I just, I came to a point, I guess, in the chapter was just like, Haji, it's like, it's all or nothing. Mm. Either you, either you put it all there or you don't write the chapter at all. Oof. Like you just leave it. And you wrote it, eh? And then I wrote it because, I don't think the chapter is half as hard or half as raw as what a lot of other people go through in their lives, you know? Yeah. And I guess it was a way of me saying that things get rough um, and I want you to know that your story is your story mm. and you own that and you have that and it's you and it's yours to tell. For instance, I, I mean, I didn't realize that you had a tough time in high school. Yeah. At all. To was me, the worst. I hated you it. were self-assured. You were quirky. You, you had a little bounce in your step. You were cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to us, you were, you were this cool person. And meanwhile, you're going through hell. Yeah. Did you, did you know that I wasn't invited to our own matric reunion, uh, ten year reunion? The picnic. I didn't also go to it. Who cares? I wasn't even invited, <laughs> bruh. I took that stuff so personally. I was like, yo, now I must feel invisible. And then 10 years later, I'm still not there. <laughs> It was hard. <laughs> it was so hard. But everything is like, you know, that chapter is so, so revealing because a lot of people also think I'm an extrovert. Yes. You know, they yes. really see me as an extrovert. And I actually like have the worst social anxiety. Like it is honestly debilitating at times. And it's terrible because like, I'm in this constant state of like, you have to always put a costume on mm. and be a certain way in order to be around people. And I think that's where like, the wittiness comes from and like the sarcasm it's not even wit it's sarcasm <laughs> you know i'd love to say it's wit because yeah. that sounds intelligent but it's actually just sarcasm and that's where all of that comes from because if you say all the things that you think people want to see and people want to hear on the outside it's almost um easier to just swallow the things that you're thinking on the inside uh, so uh, it's a it's a coping mechanism uh, it really is, yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, I want to, I'm going to take a break. I want to dive into that because I think what you're saying about swallowing the things that you're thinking, surely it added to depression. Obviously, ah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Look, in her new book, she pulls no punches when writing on our social landscape and her personal experiences from arguing why she'd rather deal with an open racist than a good one to why Islam has made her anti-religion to a constant feelings of being a failure in the eyes of her dad. After the break, we chat about the brain tumor and a near-death experience that brought father and daughter to a meeting point. It's gonna be interesting. Keep watching.
spoke to a Muslim family in the township of Laudium in Pretoria. Haji Muhawa Dawji came of age just as South Africa's democracy was finding its feet. But her childhood was not an easy one. Uh, she's had to, to battle some moments of self-deprecation, an insecurity complex, depression, thoughts of suicide. And she once drove off a bridge but lived to tell the tale. And today she's unapologetic of who she is. We are in conversation with the author of Sorry Not Sorry, Haji Muhammad Dawji. So you also state in your book that you've got a healthy relationship with death. Yes. Right? I think almost too healthy. Ex this is what <laughs> I want to now dissect. When you say healthy relationship with death, is it of your own death or anyone else around you? I think anyone else's as well. Mm. It's funny because I think having a, a healthy relationship with death is not the same as having a healthy relationship with loss. Because loss and death are obviously two very different things. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I think I have a healthy relationship with me dying and, and my experience or journey with death when I get there. Um, and other people's as well. I just feel like the relationship between the living and the dying is often a very selfish mm. relationship. Mm. And I'm, so o I'm always aware of that. So yeah, I think, I think when it's time to let go, it's time to let go. Do, do you think your depression is what contributed to, to you having a healthy relationship with death? Because what I understand depression to be is that you die many times. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you experience your death many times and you're okay with it and you would just, it must just happen already, you know? Yeah. Um, Anela, you know, it's actually such a weird thing because like I've honestly stared death in the face so many times in like suicidal attempts and that kind of thing. And depression is guilt. Mm. It's a lot of guilt. And suicide is a lot of guilt. And when you're caught in this existential crisis and in this emotional landslide, like I remember one night I was standing on the balcony and I just wanted to throw myself off. And I was there and I was so close. And because throwing yourself off is the only thing that, will ne that means you will never feel the way you feel again. But you actually start to feel like a coward. You know, I stood there for like, not a, jumping off. like a coward for not jumping off. And that isn't because I don't want to die, but that's because there's still an awareness in my heart and in my mind about who I'm leaving behind. And they're having to deal with it, you know? Mm. The, that, that's guilt. Yeah, that's guilt. Yeah. And, and so I actually called the suicide hotline that night. And yes. You say, God bless the lady who answered the phone that night in the yes. suicide hotline. What did she say to you? It's weird because when I called, I was actually looking for permission. I was hoping that she was going to, you know, I was in this <laughs> weird state of mind and I was hoping I was going to have this phone call and this woman was going to be like a suicide motivational speaker. <laughs> you can do it. Be like, yeah, <laughs> do a run up. <laughs> yeah, she was going to be like, come on, you got this. You know, you, this is the one thing you can be good at, you know. Yeah. And obviously it wasn't like that. And she just kept asking me like, what's going on? Like, tell me how you're feeling. Like, why do you feel like this? And you know, you just, it's such a state of fear that I can't even remember what, what I said or what I spoke about, but I can remember that I didn't jump that night. And like you said, depression is dying many times, but for me, it has become living many times or getting life many times. And when you're living, that's how you see it. When you're in depression, it's dying many times, but I like to see the life afterwards, mm. yeah. Do you think your perception of your father that he was hard on you was magnified by you being harder on yourself? Because I understand that your dad was hard on you, but I feel like you were harder on yourself than your dad. Uh, first of all, it definitely was not a perception. <laughs> it's very much, very much a reality. If dad, if you're watching, you were very hard on me. <laughs> but we'll talk about this later. <laughs> um, uh, no, I think... I think, you know, it's, a, it's an intertwined relationship. Yeah. I think I was always that personality. And when you don't have the language to explain it, mm. you can't make sense of it, you know. But now I can say I have always been a very self-deprecating personality. And I've internalized a lot of that. And I don't think my dad's treatment of me um, resulted in me being hard on myself. I think that was organic anyway. It was always going to be there. But I do think that oftentimes, many times, it served as a catalyst uh. for my own self-deprecation. Because I think when you're 
insecure about so many things, when you're insecure about your place in the world, when you go to like a white school as a brown person and you know, you're so little and like everyone is throwing all these words at you that you've never heard before and like you can't go home and complain because going to a good school is such a great so, opportunity. So, uh, yeah, you should be lucky you know, you're yes, going to that school. You know, like, and, and it's privilege actually. It's a privilege to go to, to like a good school. And, um, you know, you keep all of that inside and it's going to spill out in one way or another. And I think the fruit of my spilling was just more self-deprecation. Mm. Yeah. You, you speak of sending an email to your dad saying, Dad, I'm in love. I'm getting married to a woman. Her name is Rebecca. She's wonderful. She's white. She's white. <laughs> <laughs> and, and immediately then you go to the day of your wedding that your dad gave a speech at the wedding. And it yes. was such a beautiful speech that I want to oh, read. Guys, my dad was signing autographs. Really? No, he has to because this speech now <laughs> is now amazing. Yeah. Please give me a second for me to find it. Okay, it's, it's a little long. It's not long, but for the purpose of this, so I'm just going to take the last bit. Congratulations, Rebecca and Haji. I wish you all the happiness in the world and love you both dearly. Just as you have today rekindled the true meaning of the rule of love, I have no doubt that you will strive in your writing and your influence to free society from its blind adherence to dogma in favor of righteousness. May Allah bless you both. Okay, so this is somebody you thought wouldn't even attend the wedding. Yeah. Okay, I'll never speak to you again. Okay. And here he is giving such a beautiful you know, speech at your wedding. But you don't tell us what happens in the four months from the email to the speech. Was it four months? You said it's four months. It was four months. It was, eh? You said, yeah, four months later I was married. Yes, it was four yeah. months. Um, no, he just, he just came around. Like, it was very quick. It was a very quick transformation or like turn of leaf, so to speak, you know? Like, he replied to that email and he just said, I think he said something to the effect of like, you're my daughter and I love you and I'm not sure how to respond to this right now. Um, and we're all children of God, like that kind of thing, you know? It was a one or two sentence email. Um, and then, you know, it was just like such a natural thing. It was just such a, I was at Subeda Jaffa's house last night because she had me over for dinner and I was trying to explain this to her and I didn't have the words and she said, your parents showed you a softness. Yeah. And that you thought didn't exist. Yes, yeah. and that's exactly what it was. It was a softness, and that softness was so immediate and so warm and so welcoming. Um, and I confronted my own love for them and their love for me in that moment, like so quickly, in such a real way uh, that I never experienced before. And I think there was a phone call very soon after that where he was just like, I love you and I accept you and you are who you are. And screw everyone else, you know, because we grew up in a societies that are so tainted by religion and tradition and culture and in some instances castes mm -hmm. that have followed the footsteps over here all the way from India. Um, and all those things, you know, they're claustrophobic and they suffocate people's minds. And my dad didn't allow it to suffocate his mind. And then a couple of weeks after that, he called me and he was like, is there space for you at my wedding? Because I had invited him anyway, obviously. But he just said maybe he wasn't ready to come. Mm. And then my mom said she's coming. And then I think a day or two later, my dad said, he just called me and he said, do you have a chair for me at your wedding? And I said, of course, I have a chair for you at my wedding. And then he came and he said a speech and everything. And it was lovely. <laughs> just as Haji writes about Bollywood subtitles, had helped improve illiteracy in India, a UNESCO study found that people with limited access to books are reading more thanks to smartphone technology. And because you and I are constantly reading on this show, we love authors, uh, we thought that we want to give you a grander experience of reading from mobile technology. So why not try the new Huawei? They're giving you the chance to win. Have a look. Real Talk, Huawei and MTN are partnering up to celebrate the release of the new Huawei P20 series. The Huawei P20 Pro, the world's first triple Leica lens camera, is partnering with MTN SA's fastest mobile network to help you capture the best moments with your friends and family. We'll be capturing timeless moments and connecting with people in need while giving you the chance to win the Huawei P20 Pro and 10 gigabytes free once-off MTN data. So tune into Real Talk for your chance to win. Hello and 
welcome back to Real Talk with Anele for the final segment. We are joined by columnist Hygera, Haji, I call her Hygera. That's not a cool street name. Uh, Haji Muhammad Dauji, okay? She's written a book, Sorry Not Sorry, and trust me, it is amazing. She makes no apologies for being a woman. She makes no apologies for being a woman of color. She's not sorry that her truth offends, and above all, she's not sorry for writing what she likes in her debut book, Sorry Not Sorry, and she certainly makes no apologies for writing her first book, Sorry Not Sorry. So, obviously, I'm stressing the first book part because there gotta be more, right? I hope so. Uh. I mean, this is always what I've wanted to do. And the nice thing about writing is that you don't have to be around people. So it suits me just fine. You can be a little hermit, yeah. a little corner, go out for supplies and come back and write. Exactly. Or send your wife if you have one. Exactly. <laughs> but another thing that stands out for me is your, your relationship that you have with your sneakers. The fact that it's almost like you, you want to clean them yourself all the time. All the time. You don't trust anyone no, else with them. No, never. What's that about? Do you know my sneakers are, are packed in a cupboard where I have this very expensive like scarf. It was a gift from someone. Yeah. And I don't put them flat in the drawer because they're in a special drawer. Yeah. So they're on that scarf. Oh. It's like a little bed for them. Do you have it's extra flat. room there? For, do you have <laughs> extra room? But I had this unit made in my house because I have no like packing space in okay. my house. And I dedicated one drawer. Okay. To just my sneakers. Okay, because the Real Talk team, when they were reading, they found out you've got an obsession with sneakers, so they went out and they got you something. Where are the sneakers, guys? Can we? What? So, so now we. <laughs> are you joking? No, no. Tavang, come here. Tavang is our stage real? manager. He's, in, he's, he's really in charge of the show. You you can, are there you go. Insane. Thank you. Tavang. Yeah. There you go. Open can it. I open these now? You open it now. Let's see what's in there. Oh my God. You guys, <laughs> you guys really spoiled me. I know you are a size four, right? I am a size yes, four. Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm si and I got the white ones oh, on today. Oh, that, okay, good. <laughs> Jay is on my feet. Jay is on your feet, right? <laughs> guys, thank you so much. Put it right there. Thanks right. to the whole team and, and you. I'm going to actually... You can just put it on top there. Everyone see them. Before we wrap up, you'll, I'm sure you'll put, be wearing must, them as you walk everyone out. Everyone must watch my sneakers there. So, because you... You, you, you sometimes operate in corporate spaces, yep. right? Um, were you not wary of calling out publications that you used to work for that you said, I worked there, they were racist, I bounce? No. I mean, why should we be? Mm. We, you know, we just live in like shackles and chains our whole life. And like we go from like place to place, from like white monopoly capital to white monopoly capital. And we're like, oh, thank you so much for this job. And we just keep quiet because, you know, we feel like, they've gifted us this position and like whatever. But no, I'm just like at a, at a time and space now where I'm like, I deserve to be here. Uh, I'm good enough I'm, to be here. Yeah, I'm not even good enough, I'm better. Yes. You know, I'm better than you. Were you raised like, like that, um, be twice as good to get half the recognition? Definitely. Because that's how I was yeah. raised. Yeah, and we were also raised to not have verbal conversations. So we were raised to be aware of racism. I was bullied like a lot. We were raised to be like, aware of all of that, but we were also raised to not participate in it in a conversational manner. Yeah. The way you participated, or rather the way you won and you overcame, was to keep your head down, do your work, and be excellent at whatever it was you were doing. So if you were playing tennis, you'd be the best at tennis. Yeah. If you were studying for exams and you were writing exams, you'd be the best at your results, you know, yeah. like academics. If you're playing piano, you'd be the best at playing piano, because that's how you prove to people who are like basically throwing stones and whatever, that you're above them, mm. you know, that you're better. Academically, it didn't work out so well <laughs> for me, no? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pick great. up any spelling errors. You, I great. You, you're okay, <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. So, do you then go into the next one? Because I know you left U Magazine and you went to, to, to Mail and Guardian, right? Yeah. And it, it was almost like a different setting. Definitely, yeah. Yes, and you loved it, yeah. right? And, and this was your, your thing. Yes. But surely you go there and you have a little bit of, oh gosh, I'm gonna have the same struggles here. I didn't start at the Mail and Guardian with that kind of mindset, right. purely because it was, it was a dream for me. It was a goal for me to always work there. Okay. Over and above that, the position, I was so humbled by it and it was such an amazing gift from the universe. Because my favorite thing to do at that time as a journalist, because I don't like doing interviews with people, I'm not like you, like, you know? Mm. So I never had a phone on my desk, like ever, in any of my jobs, I've never had a phone on my desk. Cause I'm not that kind of reporter. Like I don't call people and like, I, I just get scared. Mm. 
-hmm. you know? So my favorite thing at that time in life was to be like, yo, if I could only have a job where I could sit on Facebook and Twitter mm. the whole day. And then it just came to me and I was like, this is lovely. This is amazing. This is what I want to do. Yeah, and every job is an education, you know, mm -hmm. and you learn things along the way. So, yeah. Listen, your book is pretty much an education and in, in a way where you're writing about things that I know and things that I agree with and sometimes disagree with, but it's nice to be able to see from somebody else's point of view, yeah. from somebody else's lived experience, and this is what this book is. So thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you and so thank much. thank you for coming. Her Thanks book is available me. at all major stores. It is brutal honest. It's hilarious. It's very funny. You're going to laugh a lot. It will make you cringe at some points. It will annoy you at some points. But most of her stories and the issues she raises are relatable. Thank you so much to Haji for making time to chat to us and for letting us get in there under her skin. And also a very big thank you to jazz guitarist Billy Monama, who was here earlier, and he's doing wonderful work in preserving African jazz. From myself and the team, we say goodbye. We'll check you out tomorrow when we've got Encore in here. You know that those Tswana guys will sing so well? They're going to be here tomorrow with the performance. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Isidingo's up next. Good night. <laughs>